Our third student reader this evening is Jack Kerwin. Jack is a Brisbane-based writer and poet with an interest in introspective work using nature as a conduit. His poetry has appeared in Glass, Scratch That and Blue Bottle Journal. He's also recently released a music project which can be found through his Instagram bio at Jack Kerwin, J-A-K-K-I-R-W-I-N. I guess we could say that he is a jack of all trades. Everybody please welcome Jack. I didn't write that last part of the book. This is a short story called The Flies. Then came the flies. The flies were God's last effort to warn the men of the house that their insolence would lead to decay. The flies were the worst kind, the fat, green, metallic kind. They're all a little too slow and easy to catch. The kind that you can throw at a wall and hear a small thud upon their impact because they actually hit it. The flies themselves are insolent. They land on your skin and drink your sweat as if they'd earned it. They know where the bins are, but they instead tread the window panes so that the neighbours might point and whisper, how vile. At first they came slow and deliberate, like the first heavy drops of rain in summer. It wasn't long before they came in thick, black, green clouds, plummeting to the sink like hail, torrential gale force. The men of the house would leave an empty beer bottle on the counter, and within the hour she'd be thick to the neck with the contorting sheen of winged alloy. On more than one occasion, the men of the house suspected they saw the bottle hop from the buzzing within, but it's more likely this was an optical illusion caused by the distorted buzzing within their ears and the heat wave like mirage emanating from the counter with each new takeoff and landing that the pests made. The delirium was getting to Walt. He couldn't rationalise what weird sin had presaged this manifestation of evil. The Lord had unleashed this plague, and something so sick could not feasibly exist without some kind of human error being tangled up around it. Was Walt being punished for his uncouth habit of snorting at police officers? Or was this the old man upstairs getting even at him for allowing his eyes to linger a little too longingly on the soft core pornography that occupied the screen of the phone in the hands of the mentally ill man that sat in front of him on the bus this morning. It's her fault. It's Jean's fault. This is her way of getting back at me. This was the first time Todd had spoken in about an hour. He'd been pacing back and forth, mouth tight shut, in part because he knew that if he opened it, he'd relive that cherished childhood trauma of riding his bike down a country lane in the late afternoon in early autumn, consuming dozens of gnats and vomiting uncontrollably for quite an hour but also because Todd knew that if he were to speak, his angst and horror would no doubt result in him making some regrettable and unsubstantiated claim about his ex, who by all accounts was a terrific person and would never willingly invite flyers into somebody's unit, regardless of past grievances. Nevertheless, Todd had spoken, and he felt the sharp pang of regret immediately. But, having overdosed rather early on that old tripe of being a man of one's word, he doubled down on his allegations. She still has a spare key, Walt. Who's to say she didn't sneak in last night, leave a fresh cut of steak on the floor? Maybe she bought those flies in her little weird dropper bottles that she used to store a perfume in. Todd had excelled in debating during high school and remained rather apt at that oh-so-desirable de skill of lying so well that one convinces himself. Walt had no interest in these ex internal affairs. He was thinking grandiose. He was thinking diplomacy. He was opening windows in an attempt to have the little maggot-brained freaks find their way out, as if that was what they wanted. Of course, this sort of appeasement never works. The flyers had willingly, knowingly, encroached on the men's sovereign domain. The flyers, in some odd form of conquest, had decided that Unit 8, Templeton Street, was ripe Lebensraum, and they were currently making the most of Walt's seemingly hospitable nature. Close that window, you part of this conspiracy? Good Lord! Todd was all but foaming at the mouth. Outside it was starting to rain, actual rain, with water and everything. There was heavy wind, and before, to before Walt could slam the window shut, a good many more of the flies had been sucked inside, as in science fiction movies where there is a hole in the shuttle and the astronaut gets huffed out into the cold vacuum of space. The lights began to, to flicker and fade, 
and there's a sound like sizzling that could be heard faintly over the deafening buzz of the little green troops. A blink and it was black. The men were in the dark. Todd cussed admirably, and with arms outstretched, tapped and fingered his way over to the couch. Walt tried to shine the torch on his phone over the whole display, but it was relatively ineffective given the palpable disturbance to the airways. Todd came to rest with a warm, wet, glistening blanket of white, wiggling maggots squirming graciously over his cold, shivering body. Walt grabbed a beer from the fridge, went outside and stood in the rain for a while. It was nice. He texted Jean. Maybe she did let the flies in. He asked if he could come over, if he could talk for a while. He said he was sort of drenched and drunk and that he'd been having better days. She said, sure. So Walt soldiered down to the bus stop, soaked to the bone, with the faintest knowledge that he was making a bad decision looming over him like the not-so-distant rain clouds. He had a vision. He had a vision of himself coming home the next morning to find the unit quiet, far too quiet, to find Todd picked apart, clean to the bone, to find his perfectly preserved skeleton sprawled out on the couch, not a fly in sight, not a maggot, nothing, just his poor friend, dead, possibly with his slender dead fingers tightly clutching a T-bone, maybe a sticky note saying, I told you so. At the bus stop, Walt waited around for a few minutes. He tapped on. He rode the line out. He tried to make his head empty, to think of nothing, which many of us know is all but impossible when attempted consciously. And he couldn't think of nothing. In fact, Walt could think of nothing but the inevitability that a fly had followed him out the door that the flies were still following him, that he could never get away from whatever sick thing it was that he'd unleashed. It was still raining heavy. The window panes were thick with dancing rivulets, staring out into some nameless, atavistic emotion that everybody knows, but nobody knows what to do with. Walt saw himself in that strange reflection as a fly on the wall. Thank you.